Hello and welcome to episode 85 of MMO Weekly, presented as always by Chitty's Cheesesteaks. I'm your host, Sal Manzo, joined by my co-host and MMO Executive Editor, Mike Mayer. And we're both joined by a very, very special guest, longtime PR man of the Mets. If you're a fan of the team, you know him, Jay Horowitz. Thank you so much for taking some time yeah. with us tonight. Thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate it. it. Good talking to you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but obviously we, we know that, you know, you're on, Mike had spoken to you to come on. We have, you know, uh, probably a ton of questions for you. We'll keep it as light as we can, no worries, fine. Fine. but uh, you know, just to kind of get started, you know, we, we would love to hear just your story, how you got started with the Mets. I mean, I know you, you, you've talked about it over the years. I know this past, I believe it was March 13th was the 44th anniversary of when you started working for the team. So I'm just curious if you can kind of talk to us that story, how it came about. You know, how I got my job at the Mets. Sure. Well, well, I, I did, to take it back to the winter of uh, of 1980, maybe uh, February, January or February, I had taken a, car, a job to be the staff guy for Tony Kubek and Joe Garagiola on NBC, uh, you know, the, the game of the week. My sure. friend had got me the job. About a week later, I got a call from somebody who said, hey, I'm Jim McGurney from the Mets. There's a job open as a PR director for the Mets. You want it? You're interested. I, I see Harold switch screwing around. I think my friend Harold was being hung up by the guy. The next day, <laughs> I found out there was a Jim McGurney who worked for the Mets. He called me back. I apologized. He said he's still interested in taking a job. So I said, listen, why not? Let me give it a shot. So I flew down to St. Petersburg. I was, I was supposed to go to the Edgewater Beach Hotel. I went to the wrong hotel. I was late <laughs> for the interview with Frank Cash and our GM. Wow. And I walk into the room at the hotel. Frank is sitting there. He's in a little white tennis short. And I was so nervous, I proceeded to spill a whole container of orange juice all over his lap. Uh, and that's how the interview started. And then he asked me uh, one question. It was about a, a guy who had written a Jim Batten kind of book. I forgot the guy he pitched for the world. Jim Brosnan. He used to okay. pitch for the White Sox. And I said, have you read Brosnan? I said, who wrote it? Shakespeare? Said, no, he pitched for the White Sox. And that was the end of my interview. I remember going to the <laughs> and I called my late mother when I got to him. I said, Mom, there's no way possible I got a separate job. And you know, 45 years later, I'm you know, I changed jobs at 18. I was a regular PR guy for 38 years. Okay. I'm the you know, the, the PR guy for the Lavar alumni guy. So 45 years, uh, April 1st is my anniversary. That's, That's incredible. It, it's such an incredible run. So to kind of give folks like an idea of like what your everyday was until 2018. Like, well, we would, we would work on game notes. Um, uh, I would get to the, I was, I'm not a big sleeper. I would get to the park. I live in Jersey. I would try to get to the bridge before seven o'clock, get yeah. to the work on game notes, answer some calls, go down and speak to the manager before the locker room opens to give them a lay of land where I think could be a problem that he might, you know, go on that day. We used to lock, open up the locker room three and a half hours before the game, help coordinate interviews, uh, you know, in, in and on the field, you know. Uh, and what, let me stop one second. One thing I try to do was to go around to the guys' lockers when I was there, not to – see, a, a good PR guy doesn't always ask for stuff. And you, you always have to ask for stuff. So I made it a business to go to a guy's locker who I didn't have to ask stuff from, just how are your family, how are your kids. Huh. Can I do anything for you? So then we would, the locker room was shut about 5.30. I'd go up to the press room, get something to eat, 6 o'clock, sit in the press room. If stuff happened during the game, the guy had two home was in the game, got hurt, extended a hitting streak, make announcements about that, go down to the locker room and had to open up 10 minutes after the game is over, do an all interview process, go up, clear my desk, go home, get a good solid three and a half hours sleep and do it again. <laughs> That's so, awesome. I go ahead, Mike. So I have a question. How how did it kind of change? I mean, you, you did it for a long, long time. So yeah, yeah, from nineteen eighty social media, guys, that's the whole thing. Yeah. When I well, first started, there was no Twitter, there was no uh, Instagram, there was no Facebook, there was no nothing. So the PR guy then used to write releases, used to break the news, but now everything breaks on uh, on Twitter, on Instagram. Sure. You know, the, when, a, when a player is hurt, the player tweets it himself. Either a player's agent or himself makes the announcement. So that's the one thing has changed. Look, look how many. You know, we used to have these uh, 
my later years with the man, he's a regular guy, PR guy, have uh, media seminars, be aware of your surroundings, who you, who you were in the elevator with, who you were taking a picture with. I mean, how many lives have been ruined, you know, because of Twitter pictures or this and that? So the, the modern player today has so much harder than the player when I first broke in because, you know, the social media just changed the landscape of everything. Right. And how, how much harder does it make, you know, your job as the PR man, you know, as far as that's concerned, social media, does that become, like you said, you broke the news, did certain things, you would be the ones to put it out first? Like, has it just become, you know, like 24-7 now as far as, like, monitoring? A lot of times and, you're reactive to things. You know, the PR guy today, you know, if an agent makes an announcement or, if, you know, a player wants to tweet something, you have to react to what the player tweets. Right. So when I was there, you were all, I'm, I'm kind of a hands-on guy. I like to be proactive and sure. be control of everything. When, and, but when the advent of Twitter stuff, that really changed. You know, I mean, you know, like if a guy's got a picture, and one thing I try to tell our guys is keep the political stuff out of your locker, out of your, you know, I mean, a lot of times if some, because you make half the people happy, half the other people not happy. So, uh, um, you know, you just got to be, you just, the play of today is going to be so much more aware of his surroundings, what he says, what he does, who he goes out with, you know, that, that kind of stuff. Sure. Now, I just, I'm curious. Obviously, you talked about before, you know, you got the job with the Mets. You were doing the statisticians for the, the game of the week for NBC, like you were talking well, I, about. I didn't start it because I, I was supposed to start April 1st that year. Okay. And I, I, I went to the Mets and, you know, a friend of mine. The That's incredible. Clone, who, uh, who, who got me working at NBC, got me a job. And, sure. And then I just couldn't pass up the opportunity to work. Right. For, for a team, and I told them, unfortunately, I'm taking a job at the Mets. Now, with that, would, was what was your end? Would you always want to work in, in, in PR? Was no, it more I, stats? I what did you... When I grew up, I uh, okay. I was a I was uh, politically inclined. I, I I campaigned for uh, for Robert Kennedy. I oh. I uh, I was a billionaire in the Kennedy family in Camelot. My whole thing. I, I when a few people I campaigned for George McGovern. We didn't work out. I think we won two states in '72, and I, I went to NYU and got my doctorate in in uh, in political science. You guys remember when you were too young? Pierre Salinger was Kip, John Kennedy's press secretary. Okay, that's who I wanted to be. I wanted to be you know uh, in politics, but I, somehow I got diverted. <laughs> well, so you you didn't even grow up a Mets fan, right? I was a Giant fan. I was a diehard Willie Mays fan. Wow. I loved, my, my father took me, and when the Giants moved to in, in San Francisco in 57, 58, my father used to take me to Philadelphia to see the play there. I remember in 54 when Willie Mays made the great catch against Rick Wirtz in the World Series, watching on TV. And you know, one of the things I'm proud of, but we did in my reign here, you know, we got Willie Mays' his number retired. Yep. You know, uh, I mean, you know, when Willie was traded to the Mets in 72, Joan Payson, who was the owner of the team, made a pledge, when you retire, we're going to retire number 24. Somehow that fell through the crock or cracks. Sure. And I'm on the, one of the people on the Hall of Fame committee, and a group of us explained to Steve Cohen, our owner, what the promise was. He said, listen, we got to fulfill a pledge made to an old owner, and we retired a number. You know, you, we got some criticism. You know, he only played for the Mets for a year and a half. But the deal was, it was really what his contribution was to the game of baseball, to New York. And, you know, the, the Braves did the same thing with Hank Garrett's numbers, retired in Milwaukee and Atlanta. So, and you know, Willie was my idol, and, and I know it meant a lot to him to have his number retired in New York. Yeah, absolutely. And we want to talk about Old Timers Day a little bit. We know you had, you know, a lot to do with that. But you talk about growing up a Giants fan. I am just a little curious. Can you tell us what it was like, just like with the Giants and the Dodgers leaving and kind of that void? I broke know, my heart. It, it broke my when the Giants moved. It broke my heart. I was. We used to have discussions. Willie Mays, Duke Snyder, Mickey Mantle. Who's better? Sure. It was always you know with Willie Mays and and you know and I I you know I my my father my 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 father Milt was nice enough to take us every time the Phillies would come into the Giants would come to San Francisco and we went there. To, to see the Giants play a series. What team I, I was fortunate to get his autograph. And when I started to work with the Mets, my, the late, my good friend Rusty Staub made a formal mm -hmm. introduction to Willie. We were in San Francisco and meeting him, my trips to New York. And here is one of the highlights of my life. But uh, it was always, you know, Mets, you know, Dodgers, Mets, Snyder, Mick Mantle. And I was always uh, on, on, on Willie May's side of it. 
Yeah, my my grandfather actually. Um, oh, grandfather, nice man. You got the <laughs> grandfather bomb on me. No, it's, I'm just kidding. but my my grandfather grew up. Uh, he grew up in New York, and he was a yeah. Brooklyn Dodgers fan. Yeah. And he was a huge Pee Wee Reese fan, and he he talked about kind of like going to Ebbets Field as a kid, and then yeah, the, yeah, like that void that uh, kind of happened in yeah, a five or six year period. I became a Met fan on April first, nineteen eighty, when I worked at the Met. Yeah, <laughs> until then, I was a Giant fan. That's awesome. That's that's incredible. Um, and you know, obviously, you talk about like you're on the Hall of Fame committee. You work with the Mets for so long. You know, I, there's so you know, I can't imagine how many you know great people that you work with. Um, but I think Mike had a little question just as far as a connection there that he wanted to ask you. Sure, sure. Yeah, I, yeah. Like Sal said, you've worked with a lot of great people, and one of the ones that I was lucky enough to meet and really helped me when I was um, just getting started was Shannon Ford. And yeah. I, I just wanted to get a little bit of your great take lady, your relationship lady, with her. You know, and the thing is, you understand, when she came to work as an intern from St. John's in the mid-90s, women in professional sports were really an anomaly. And, and and she was a real trailblazer what she did. She wasn't afraid of the players. She stood up to them. When, when I asked her to do something, she, she would always do it. You know, and it, she, she had a way of, you know, the PR person is a tough job to let me see if I can get this right. The owners think the PR uh, people uh, prejudice to the players. The players think they like the owners better, uh, and, and the media <laughs> think they like the owners and the players better. Sharon <laughs> had the unique ability to to translate. You know, all three people. There wasn't one person said a bad word about her in the 22 years she worked for the Mets. And some legacy she left, and a great worker and a great batman. She's. You know, we've been gone for over eight years now. We really, it's really hard for me to believe. And that was one of the reasons why I wrote my book. You know, um, I wrote a book just to talk about memories. And when I wanted to have, I have a chapter in, the, in there that they gave to Shannon. And the whole thing, whatever I can, whether it's her birthday or other things, I just like to keep her memory alive. And the purpose of the book that I wrote was to have a chapter let the people who hopefully read it won't forget her, what she did, and, uh, you know, how good a person she was, and a good mother, and, you know, the whole bit. Yeah, I always make the short, short to retweet or share everything that you put out. Yeah. There. Like I said, I I was pretty young and pretty new to it, and she, she made it super e uh, pretty nervous, and she made it really easy. What, what she did, she indoctrinated me, indoctrinated me to the world of the blogger. I mean, as an old-fashioned guy, what do those blog guys have to be here? Jay, give them a chance. One day, they're going to be the, you know, they're going to, it, it's going to turn. And she was the one who was on me to be do the right thing and have blogger nights, have players come in and speak in the press room to her. So she she uh, really led me down the right way. And just a remarkable woman way. She was able to just to be friends to everyone, ownership, uh, players, coaches, me, to everyone. That's awesome. You know, everything that, that the Mets have talked about over the years with her, I, I can't – can't imagine, you know, a loss like that. And obviously it was such a big part of the Mets community. It's great that you guys are able to keep continuing to put her, you know, make her memory out there and keep her uh, memory alive, which is awesome. And yeah, you know, when she we passed away, we, we had over a thousand people in the memorial service, the city field. David Wright spoke and it was really a touching uh, thing to her for her memory that day. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, going kind of with that, obviously you talked about your book that you wrote. Um, I'm sure there's, a lot of moments, you know, in your Mets career, uh, you know, dealing with different players, different situations. I'm just wondering if there's a particular uh, moment or anything that sticks out that that you're, um, you know, professionally maybe most proud of. Or was that, you know, a, a highlight for you? And then maybe if there's a story that, you know, was a difficult moment, whether it was a player or something like that, that you really felt like, oh, man, I don't, I don't know what's going to happen here now. Well, probably, you know, the, the well, let me start with we don't know what's going to happen. So we're in 1986, we're losing to the Red Sox uh, by two runs, sure. bottom of the 10th inning, game six. We, we won 108 plus, plus four, 114 games. The whole National League hated us. We would get the fights. Mike Ta Tyson came and visited us. He loved Ray Knight because Lane Knight was a boxer. I'm sitting there with Davey Johnson and Daryl Johnson, who's one of our scouts, figuring out how the hell we're going to explain to the rest of the media, how these guys, how we choked, you know, basically. Right. Then all of a sudden, you know, Gary Carter singles, Ray Knight singles, Kevin Mitchell singles, 
Mookie's about the wild pitch, the go with the ball to Buckner. We win that game. Next day we rally. We're down. But people forget we didn't win the series that night. You know, we only tied it three three. Next night we're losing three nothing again. We right we right we rally against Roger Clemens. Tie it up. You know Keith and Andy gets a big hit. Ray Knight and Darrell have home runs and we win. You know, we win seven to six. But if you want to ask me one thing, when I die, on my legacy would be what we did in 2001 after the attacks and 9-11. Sure. We, we had a group of guys that got the situation. They, you know, we, we gave back to the community. Everybody talks about Mike's home run, which was tremendous. But there was the countless visits to, to Ground Zero, the exchange of hats at Ground Zero with the firemen and policemen, the visits to the to the hospitals, the how our how our um, uh, parking lot was turned to recovery area to get supplies downtown. I mean, we we really helped New York heal, you know, that day. And I can't believe in two years, this is 2024. It's going to be 25 years sure. since 2001. But we had we were always fortunate enough to have a group of guys that year, starting with Bobby Valentine, the manager, to the Al Ryder, John Frankel, Todd Zia, Roman Matura, you know, guys like uh, Joe McEwing, Vance Wilson, Alfonso. Uh, we they got what it was to give back, and that was the most enjoyable. Maybe enjoy is not the right word. Most rewarding month or two in my career. What we did to help the city heal and, you know, starting with Mike's home run, but way before and way after that, years after that too. I can't even imagine that, you know, I, I was a, a kid when everything, you know, that had all went down, but just remember that whole week, remember that game sitting in my living you know, my mom's living room on the floor, uh, Mike's home run. It's just a whirlwind. I can't, can't even imagine. Yeah, just one thing, not to cut you off. A lot of people didn't want us to play because it was too <laughs> soon. And we got a lot of criticism. You know, we it was only we played, we played in, in against Pittsburgh in Pittsburgh. I think the fifteenth or sixteenth, but in sure. Pittsburgh, and we so we played ten days after the attack. Right. And the and the stadium, the security was just unbelievably bad. It was like a fortress. You know what? Oh, you know, I, I don't remember. I was I told friends of mine not to come that night because they're going to bomb the stadium. What's going to happen? Sure. And we in the locker room. There's a lot of fear, a lot of trepidation. But once we heard the cheers and you know USA in the stands and you know I think Diana Ross and Liza Minnelli singing on night, then we knew it was the right thing to do. You know, then we knew it was the right thing to do. Well, and I think, like you said, I think you guys were lucky enough to have the right group of players no at question. the right time to be able right to do time. that too. Yeah, John Frankel, a local guy from Queens, Al Leiter from New Jersey, Bobby Valentine from Connecticut, you know, and, and just veteran guys who just got it when it meant to give back. And I was really blessed to be working with those guys back then. Yeah, absolutely. And you mentioned Mike Piazza, obviously. I do want to just transition a little bit, just a question that I have. Can you kind of talk about just what it was like, the whirlwind of those few days of the Mike Piazza trade from the Marlins, him coming down that first game, um, and just kind of how his, you know, that trade kind of really solidified that those kind of late 90s, that yeah. early 2000s teams. Yeah. He transformed our team, guys. He was like a rock star. When, when, before we got there, we didn't have, let I me mean, put it in PR terms, we didn't have columnists, travelers, travelers on the road. Sure. When Mike got there, you know, the Joel Shermans, the Bill Manns of the world, the Steve Jacobs of the world, they traveled because what was Mike going to do? You know, and he, he just gave us, um, you know, the charisma. Mm -hmm. He was like, I, he was like a rock star, the leader of the band. I remember that day, I he, we got him in a Saturday afternoon we were playing the Brewers, and I went to uh, the LaGuardia Airport. He was late. We picked him up in a limo, got him to the park late, and we had the press conference after the game that day. Lighter pitch a shutout. We beat the Brewers three nothing, and the, the old Jets locker was just packed. It was like, uh, and he didn't, you know, when he first started. He was getting booed, and it was really up in yep, the air whether yep. he was inside or not. And and, but it, and Mike weathered the storm in, in our Hall of Fame, in a Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. But he just he, he just gave us credence. He just gave us acceptability. And be, we became a, sh a show. It's like with the Yankees, like with Soto and, and those guys yeah. there. They, they have that little, you know, that, you know, a lot of guys don't have. Yeah, absolutely. And not, not to age anything. And I'm sure a lot of people say they were there, but I was six years old being on father's day. It makes sense. Now my, uh, with today with my grandfather and my father, we were at that, at 
at Mike's first game against the Brewers. Saturday um, afternoon. Three nights. Saturday, yeah, yeah. That was three my first time against the Brown Lighter. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I was a little little six year old there, and that was my first taste of Mike Piazza, and I was hooked ever since. But his beginning wasn't, you know, it wasn't smooth. He, yep. It was there was a little trepidate whether he's going to sign or not, but sure. uh, when he decided to sign, which is great. Absolutely. Now I'm going to kind of transition from him to another guy that ended up in the Hall of Fame, and another guy that I that had to wait too long in the Hall of Fame, and I know you had a particular like hand in pushing for that, and that's Gil Hodges. Yeah. And, Kind of what that meant to you to finally I mean, you get know, him in the hall. The best thing about that guy is that his his late wife Joan was able to be alive, uh, you know, uh, to see to hear him get getting inducted thirty five times. He was on ballots and rejected thirty five times. And when I did a lot of research involved with that, and there was so many people involved with this thing, which I found out how instrumental Gil Hodges was in helping Jackie Robinson transition to baseball. You know, P.B. Reese got a lot of credit, the shortstop on the team. But Gil Hodges would, would stand up for Jackie. The late Vince Scully told me a story once when they were in St. Louis. People threw beer on Jackie, and Gil went over and put his arms around him. And before he died, uh, Vince wrote an essay for, uh, for MLB.com, which was picked up and helped sway the voters, you know, to, to vote. Uh, in the, and then... The other thing, too, is he, what I found, to get in on those writer's ballots, you need a sponsor. Joe Torrey was, was Gil's sponsor. Joe Torrey from Brooklyn knew what Gil Hodges meant to the community. And when, when, in addition to his all-stars and stuff like that, great family man, um, great in the community, great the stuff he did with Jackie Robinson, which I, I think we helped tell that story. And, you know, character does matter. And, and you know, will be it's 300 plus, 50 plus home runs and all stars and, you know, but just a great, great man. And, and, and I'll never forget the day, that day was December the 6th that I was waiting at home. The Hall of Fame was going to call his daughter, Irene. You know, we were going to get to call by six o'clock if he got in. I'm looking at my clock, it was 5.59 and 30 seconds. Finally, Irene called me and said, we got in, we made it. Man, but just and we're so happy that that his wife knew his wife died a couple months after that. But she went went to her death knowing that after all the years of fruition, that you know the, the, that her husband got in and it was a great man. I just really saw. I never got a chance to work with him. Yeah, right. I, and even you took you hear uh, former players from the Miracle Mets, right? Those teams talk about Gil as a manager, right? They they couldn't have set you know. T- uh, Spoke highly and said there was nobody else that could have rallied that team won, to make that. You know, wouldn't have won without him. He 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 wasn't have didn't have meetings. He treated the twenty fifth guy like the number one guy. Used the entire roster. Got guys like Al Weiss, J.C. Martin into the games. Uh, uh, Rod Gaspar. All the everybody played a part, and he. You know, he didn't treat Seaver any differently. He treated everybody the same. His door was always open. And to a man, I got to be exceptionally close to the 69 guys. And to a man, he said the same thing. We never win it without him. You know, he the first guy to use, uh, uh, you know, five guys in the infield to bring the outfields in. He went to pitch hit the right time. A guy way ahead of his time. And the thing that really hurt Gil, he died at 47. And if he had won a couple of more, maybe one or two more World Series after that, it wouldn't have taken so long. But thank God that he, that he finally got in. Yeah, so the kind of transition from that, you mentioned the 69 guys. And we, I mean, at obviously Sal and I weren't alive for that World Series, but it, it helped. I know certainly like a younger generation, the old timers day, that certainly helped um, kind of teach some younger guys like us that see some of those players and kind of what they meant to the organization. Yeah. We, what did it, you know, I got to thank our ownership and the Cohn family. We invited 68 players. We didn't, we, we, we didn't, we gave them gifts two days in a hotel. Um, uh, everything, what their families there, uh-huh. great meals. And, you know, to me, a couple of the great stories are, uh, are you know, we, we, we brought, Five or six, seven managers back. We got guys from the 60s, 70s, you know, six or seven managers. But two stories I wanted to relate to you. Uh, John Stearns, the dude, a good friend of mine, 
uh, he willed himself to come to that game. He was dying of Alzheimer's and cancer. He went in a bounty cage that day, took some balls at first base. A couple of days after he passed, a couple of months after he passed away, we had a guy, an 80-year-old pitcher, Steve Dillon, whose father is our director of security, went on the mound, pitched a couple of innings. It was great. Frank Thomas, an original 62 men, uh, came. He came to the game with a broken back, and unfortunately, he, he came with his family and and he passed away. Those guys, it meant so much to them. And I can't tell you, all of the, you know, guys like Billy Wagner and Turk Wendell and Franco love to BS with the old and, and you know, Ken McKenzie is another early man who passed away. It was, it was great scenes in the locker room with the younger guys talking to the older guys and getting a sense of the history. My first manager, Joe Torrey, was there. You know, Bobby V, uh, you know, Terry Collins, Willie Randolph. It was just a great, great day. And uh, it's something I'm just, you know, never forget. And I'm just glad to be a small part of that. It was an incredible event. I mean, obviously, you know, the Mets had such a good team that year as well. Keith gets his number retired. It's such right. a was such like a, a capper for what, what was a great season. And like Mike said, it was great for us, you know, learn a lot of some of those, those, you know, first generation Mets there and, and kind of learn their stories and everything. It really was an awesome. Event. And the players learned a lot too, guys, you know, the older, the guys, they, I mean, they enjoyed meeting the 69 Mets. We had, sure. you know, Craig Anderson was there from the 62 Mets. Jake Hook, who got the first win for the Mets, the 62 was there. So okay. the older guys, they gravitated toward the younger guys and older guys gravitated together to get a sense of what it was like, you know, playing there. And it, it was, it was just a really, we had great weather and, you know, it was just, it, it couldn't have worked out any better. Couldn't have worked out any better. And, and it I, got Daniel Murphy back in pro baseball. He did so yeah, well Daniel in old Murphy, times. They yeah. signed with the Ducks after. And, and the best thing, he beat Chase Hutley in a home run hitting contest in London, which made <laughs> me right. kind of happy too. No <laughs> offense uh, to Chase so Hutley, but... <laughs> Um, and I, I think that kind of goes to the point of, I mean, you took, you switched roles in 2018 and obviously yeah. a couple of years later was when Steve Cohen took over as owner. Right. And I think, I mean, I, I don't want to talk about previous regimes, but talk about just the fact that Steve Cohen has really done a great job of making sure that they remember players that were great for the Mets, whether it's that type of event or it's the retirement, like you're talking about Willie Mays and just different other things that they've done to make those players feel welcome with the Mets now. Yeah. One thing too, I got to give uh, props to Will Ponce too. They, I, they hired me in, in 1980. I worked here over 40 years and they had a recognition of the past too. So I got to, you know, it wasn't like we went in cold all of a sudden, you know, Deal. We had done a lot of good things under the World Punch regime. We did start the Hall of Fame. The Cones have been great, but I, I just kind of say that, uh, you know, I, you know, friend of Jeff Wilpon, I, I still speak to him. They're still friends and say they're the ones that got me started in this job. And they're the ones that put me there in a the new job in 18, in, in 2018. So just to be fair to everybody. Oh, for sure. I, I just think, I mean, obviously, recency bias with. The, the Coens and seeing what they've done. And I, no, I, no, just, I hear you. I hear you. And I just think Steve, uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to kind of point to the fact that ha how good they've done with getting. No, they've been very inside. supportive of any yeah. that we've done. And, and they're, you know, we have, to, you know, we're not, we're not going to have, uh, uh, we're not going to have an old time as a game. We retired Daryl's and Dwight's number this year. We have guys like uh, Billy Wagner, Al, Al Leiter, Robin Ventura, Dave Maliki, and Todd Humley coming in for one-off visits. So even though we don't have the one gigantic, uh, okay, we're doing these things throughout the year to keep the alumni frame thing uh, burning. Absolutely. And you know, you, you mentioned Doc and Dow getting the number of tarts. So I do have to ask you just what that was like for you personally, seeing them, you know, finally get their, their due as, you know, Mets greats. Obviously, like you said, you were there at the height of those, those eighties runs there. I can't imagine what it was like getting to see those two guys, at the height of their power. So oh, I'm curious what it was like it, for you seeing their numbers. It, it was, um, you know, D D Dwight Gooden's games in the eighties were like a happening. Let's have dinner someplace, go watch Dwight pitch with the K corner. Is he going to strike at 14, 15, or 16? And Dow's home runs, you know, um, majestic swings. And, you know, when he hit the clock in St. Louis, yeah, listen, those guys have been through a lot. A question I always get asked a lot is shouldn't they be in the Hall of Fame? Is the career not a success because they're not in the Hall of Fame? 
both of those guys now are giving back in the community, doing things with kids. And, you know, Dallas is an, and his wife, Tracy, are ordained ministers now. So maybe they're not in the Hall of Fame, but sometimes, you know, it might be things a little bit more important in the plaque in the Hall of Fame. And what these two guys are doing now, I think it's great. And, and after all the travail and, um, you know, stuff, stuff that they went through in the 80s, they resurrected their lives, they're doing good now. And I'm proud to be their friends for, you know, over 40 years. That's incredible. I, I can't even imagine, like you said, just seeing them, everything full circle now for them getting their, their deal that they should as Mesh legends and doing, doing even better. Like you said, you know, for the community and everything, which is sure. great. Um, but the last thing I had for you, because having you here, I, I can't not ask about David, Wright. Um, I just want to just, you know, get your, your thoughts on working with him during his career and just what he's doing, you know, now is his role with Mets as a Mets ambassador. Yeah, he's, uh, I always tell people a seven time all-star as good a player as he was, he was a hundred times better person. Sure. His father was a policeman. He got a great sense of community. He started his own foundation at 22. He's living in California now with his three young kids. And I could ask him to do something. I never had to ask him twice, whether it's to sure. write a letter to a sick kid, make a call to a someone who got injured. He was always there, never turned away an autograph. You know, and unfortunately, of injuries that happened, he he probably still could be playing now, maybe, and would be well on his way to a Hall of Fame career too. But he's just a delightful person. He 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 just understood what it meant to be a player in New York. He did all the things in the community. Went to the Ronald McDonald House. Went to hospitals. Stayed late to sign autographs. Just everything he wanted to do is, he was a PR guy's dream. You know, I get to work. I, I tell him that now I, he can't get rid of me because now he's one of my alumni guys. So, <laughs> so I got to, we, we speak a couple of times a week. He went to London to represent us there. And he, he comes, come to, he's going to be in New York in July doing some things. So we stay in touch, probably speak to him a couple of times a month. And uh, anytime I need something, he always returns to call. And uh, just a real delight and a real, as we say in my religion, guys, a real mensch. <laughs> awesome. That's well, well uh, Jay, I want to thank you for coming on. No Thanks for talking all with us. And, uh, it, it was it was great to have you on. All right, appreciate it. Maybe I'll see you around the stadium sometime soon. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Jay. We appreciate it. Guys, thank you for your time. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Have a good night. You too, guys. Bye. 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 Bye.